So you know you're at a science talk when somebody can say with a straight face, what's really great about neuroblasts. <laughs> Uh, that's great. So, do I have control over this, or, or uh, no. not really? No. Okay. Well. So just point at me. All right. I'll go. We'll do, we'll do that. <laughs> all right. Well, it's a pleasure to come speak with you. I recognize some faces. Uh, don't recognize others. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully, by the time we're all done here tonight, we have uh, some reason to have some newfound optimism for for where we are with cancer. Uh, one of the big burdens of my job, okay, so I'm an oncologist, one of the things I hate is big social situations because uh, invariably you get into a crowded room and you know, people always want to know, well, what do you do for it? Well, I'm an oncologist. And I get the same response every time. Ugh, <laughs> that must be really hard. And I don't know if I'm just an optimistic person or, or, or what, but I actually find it tremendously satisfying because we deal with real problems and, and real issues and, and uh, uh, we get to meet patients at a real critical time in their, in their life and, um, uh, and, and hopefully affect positive change. Uh, but in the field of cancer, I find myself almost getting goosebumps right now when I, when I think about where we are in the grand scheme of things. And, and this doesn't project perfectly well, but, but this is... Um, the top 10 categories of drugs being developed, okay? So here at the bottom, uh, gosh, I can't even read this. What do we have? Dermatological. Um, they say blood disorders, but these are like uh, uh, benign blood disorders, so that's not totally fair. Respiratory, gastrointestinal, diabetes, cardiovascular, pain, inflammation, infections, central nervous, and then vastly exceeding everything else is cancer. In fact, there's probably more drugs in development for cancer than almost all other um, conditions combined. And, you know, I, I have to say, hope is on the way. Um, and, and in fact, we're seeing some of the first fruits of that uh, uh, right now. And what I want to do with tonight's talk is, is go back to a real dark place, 1940, 1950. Talk about where cancer was just, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and, and, and put that in counterpoint to where we are today and, and where research is going today. Because I think that there's this notion that we've been at war with cancer for, you know, 1971, Nixon declared war on cancer, and what have we done? Have we made any progress? And in fact, I think we've made tremendous progress, so much progress that it's, it's uh, um, it, it gets me up every morning to, to go to work and, and think about what's coming. And, uh, Hopefully I can share some of that enthusiasm with you tonight because our lymphoma leukemia uh, um, uh, team in training, you guys are the ones who are at the forefront of affecting change. You're the ones who are sponsoring these people who are finishing up grad school and, and saying to themselves, well, gosh, do I go get a teaching job or do I go get an um, industry job or, or do I stay with research? You know? And you enable those careers. I think that was the best definition, the best explanation of what a postdoc is. I, I never got it right with my parents. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, without that award, he doesn't come here, he doesn't start that project, he goes on to something else. So, you know, he may have gotten uh, the career development grant, which pays for our lab supply, a kind of an okay salary for a couple years and so forth, but what you really got is a career. You know, you guys got somebody to, who's going to de devote his life to to researching new drugs, and, and it's because you guys intersected with him at a real critical moment in his career, and Minuri's career, and, and, and uh, um, you know, that's what you guys are paying for, and it's worth every single penny. It's the cheapest, cheapest money you guys can, uh, can raise. So Sarah, go ahead. So the potential, and this, oh, you're just gonna hit them in rapid order. There's currently over 900 drugs in development for cancer. More drugs are being developed for cancer than all other indica indications combined. And really a detailed understanding of cancer biology is emerging so that when drugs are developed, they're being developed smart, in, in a smart manner now. And, and the, the success rate is much higher, uh, the failure rate is much lower. What I'd like to do is go through four, four time periods of research, okay? Um, what I would call the early years, 1940 to 1950. Uh, then what I would call the foundation years, really going from 1950 to 2000. You know, this is getting pretty recent here. Uh, I would like to then transition to what I call the modern era, which I date right around 2000. 
and talk about why even just now this year, I think we're, we're kind of stepping lightly into the future, okay? Uh, so before 1946, cancer looked something like this. This was um, uh, uh, William Halstead. He was a surgeon at um, uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was such an intense surgeon uh, and just wanted to be in the operating room all the time. He developed a, a tremendous cocaine habit. Um, and his observation was kind of, no matter how much surgery we do, this cancer keeps coming back. So what he said is make the surgery bigger, make it uh, uh, you know, more intense. So uh, he was kind of the pioneer of what was called the radical mastectomy. And this isn't really what's done anymore, but, but uh, um, in the surgery, you know, they would remove the breast, they would remove the pectoralis ma major muscle, the pectoralis minor, everything down, and so you were left with just ribs, you know, and, and it was a tremendously disfiguring surgery, and, and, and uh, what's not shown here is the tremendously swollen arm that always resulted, um, and, and um, uh, yet the observation was you could do everything you could with this cancer, but it always came back somewhere else, or, you know, oftentimes came back. And um, this is a picture of Emil Grube, um, and, and I, I, I call your attention to him right here at an early stage in his career um, and his hands. Uh, Emil Grube was the first person to think about applying radiation uh, to cancer. And of course, we didn't know much about the side effects of radiation and, and you know, you would get these tremendous burns and so forth. And these are a picture of Emil Grube's hands at the end of his career, tremendously disfigured by the uh, cumulative radiation he had been exposed to uh, over, over his career. And, and again, surgery and radiation, the, the idea was, was you would get local therapy but systemic failure. You remove the breast but then it, the cancer came back in the liver or in the lungs. And, and this was happening at a time, you know, 1928 penicillin was, was uh, coming out. This idea that you could give medicines that affected the whole body. Um, and there was a lot of hope of, you know, maybe we could do something like that in, in cancer. So we often refer to the war on cancer, and in fact, the war on cancer began December 2nd, 1943. Uh, the Allies were moving up the Italian peninsula um, and had uh, um, come over from North Africa, and a uh, ship by the name of the John Henry, um, uh, pictured here, was right outside the port of Barry, Italy. And at this point, the Battle of Britain hadn't transpired, so the Luftwaffe was still very much in, in, in presence, and a German patrol spotted uh, these, these um, cargo ships below and dropped a number of bombs on the ship. The ship exploded, tremendous explosion. People died in the, in the explosion. Um, but what happened that, that became the foundation of, of um, where we are today is these ships were carrying mustard gas. They shouldn't have had mustard gas in World War II. We had signed on to the Geneva Convention. And what happened was the people around the town of Barry all got sick and infections and skin burns and, and, and so forth. So this was a tremendous embarrassment to the United States at the time. Um, so shortly thereafter, the Office of Chemical Warfare was founded uh, um, by the government to actually research, okay, we've been using these drugs or, you know, the, these, these chemical warfare and, and we don't even really know what these things do, so let's research them. Um, and, and there are scientists in labs around the country given contracts to, to uh, look at different chemotherapies and, and so forth. Uh, so uh, these two people here at Yale, uh, Goodman and Gilman, and, and I don't actually know the story completely, but Goodman I think has a brother who ends up in Portland. Uh, which I'll come back to here in a minute, but um, got the contract for studying mustard gas, right? And they found that, gosh, if you make it in a liquid form instead of the gas form and you inject it into mice, all the white blood cells go away and they don't get the blistering thing. So maybe if we wanted to get rid of white blood cells, we give intravenous mustard gas. Um, and, you know, there, there were no IRBs, no, um, you know, safety mechanisms or whatever. I mean, they just had wards and wards of patients dying with cancer. And so this is the picture of the very first patient with lymphoma uh, treated with intravenous mustard gas. 
And, and if you read the, the thing here, it, it says, appearance of terminal lymphosarcoma, that was the name for it, in the radiation uh, resistant stage, uh, four days after in, uh, uh, induction of, of um, this drug. And, and I don't know how well it projects to the back of the room, but you can see big lymph nodes here and here and here and uh, big you know, facial lymph nodes in, in this area. And of course, this is, I don't know if this is Schwarzenegger or what, but he's got these ripped arms, you know, just <laughs> a couple days later. And, and, you know, this was the first application of chemotherapy uh, for cancer. Um, next slide. Uh, this is the paper published in the Journal of American Medical Association, 1946, uh, nitrogen mustard therapy, um, use of methyl bis beta chlorethylamine hydrochloride and tris beta chlorethylamine hydrochloride for Hodgkin's disease, lymphosarcoma, lim <laughs> leukemia, and certain allied and miscellaneous disorders. <laughs> I'm not sure what the miscellaneous disorders are. Um, but, but I do point out Morton Goodman right here, only because a patient came to my clinic um, just a couple months ago, uh, and, and she told, she's diagnosed with lymphoma, and I was getting her history, and, and um, she said, well, you know, back in, back in 19, uh, well, let's see, what was it, 1960, uh, I was originally diagnosed with lymphoma. 1960, this is 2010, we're 50 years later, right? And she goes, this doc by the name of Goodman treated me with, with mustard. Uh, and and uh, here this woman came into my clinic 50 years later, uh, and this is just a couple months ago. Um, uh, so anyhow, next slide. Sidney Farber, on the other hand, is, is, is uh, not necessarily the first to the party, but uh, perhaps considered the father of, of chemotherapy. Um, he was a uh, uh, pediatric pathologist in Boston, and um, he had been real interested in uh, the work of, of some people just you know, two decades earlier who were studying pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is low red blood cells, um, and they called it pernicious because no matter how much iron you gave, the anemia didn't correct. You know, everybody thought, well, anemia, you give iron, and I, I'm not so sure primary care docs have changed yet. I, I still see the same thing. They got lots of iron, lots of iron, lots of iron. <laughs> Anyhow, um, uh, what was pernicious about it was um, it wasn't because of iron deficiency. It was because of folic acid deficiency. And, and so um, they had learned that if you make these extracts of... of um, you know, certain fruits you can get folic acid and, and these people's anemia corrected. So that was pernicious anemia. And Yella Subarbaro was, was a um, uh, gentleman who had gotten his PhD in, in India, uh, um, came, got a postdoc in Boston, um, couldn't get a job. I don't know if the economy was bad. Ended up being a doorman at one of the hospitals in, in uh, Boston. Um, after being a doorman for a while, uh, uh, got into a lab, probably had a Lymphoma Leukemia Society award, um, <laughs> and, and uh, um, decided, well, what I want to do is I want to make synthetic folic acid, okay? So he set out to make synthetic folic acid, and, and of course, any scientist who does lots of science knows it probably takes about 50 experiments uh, gone wrong to get the one to go right. And so he had lots of failures and rejects. Um, and I'll come back to those failures and rejects in just a moment. So Sidney Farber um, says, well, gosh, folic acid is good for anemia. Let's try it for leukemia, right? So uh, the next uh, pediatric leukemia comes into the hospital. And again, no IRB, no preclinical science, no clear-cut rationale. But hey, if folic acid is good for you, let's give it to leukemia. And what happens? Uh, this experiment almost derailed uh, Sidney Farber's entire career and, and almost got him kicked out of the university because one of the limiting growth rate features for acute leukemia is a deficiency of folic acid. You know, they're growing as fast as they can. They need folic acid. And so he walks in and gives folic acid. The disease explodes and, and uh, um, you know, the patient succumbed to, to his disease and uh, it created quite a stir and, and he almost got kicked out of the, the university. 